I'm Sherry, and today we're going to talk about anthropogenic eutrophication and algal blooms of the Murray Darling. Don't worry, if you're lost already, you're not alone. They're big, confusing words. But anthropogenic just means caused or produced by humans, and eutrophication is when a waterway has excess nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. So what we're really talking about here is how humans pollute waterways, which feed algal blooms. Humans cause eutrophication through agricultural activities like applying fertilizer to crops, some of which runs off into nearby streams, lakes, rivers, and oceans. We also cause eutrophication when sewage effluent, feedlot slurry, and urbanization run off. All of those contain nutrients, including nitrogen and phosphorus. So when they find their way into water, the water contains excess nutrients. These excess nutrients feed blue-green algae, which are actually cyanobacteria, and not algae at all. Excess nutrients cause cyanobacteria to vigorously reproduce if the water is warm and still. This sudden bloom of blue-green algae forms a thick mat that blocks sunlight from entering the water, which means aquatic plants can't photosynthesize. Some blue-green algae even produce toxins, including heptatoxins that cause liver damage and neurotoxins that cause nerve damage, making algal blooms very dangerous. When bloom conditions are no longer favorable, like if it starts raining, which gets the water flowing, or if excess nutrients are used up, then the blue-green algae die. They fall to the bottom of the river, lake, or seafloor, where they're decomposed by other bacteria. This decomposition requires lots of oxygen, though, so oxygen levels in the water are severely depleted and many aquatic plants and animals die. Sometimes oxygen depletion is so severe that practically nothing survives. There are 415 of these so-called dead zones worldwide. The largest is in the Baltic Sea, followed by the Gulf of Mexico. Here in Australia, there are 10 dead zones around the southern states. Many Australian rivers, streams, and lakes have annual algal blooms. And there's anecdotal evidence that Aboriginals' new water could sometimes be toxic, which in hindsight is probably due to blooms. But the first recorded bloom in the whole world wasn't until 1878 in Lake Alexandria, South Australia. Bloom frequency is on the rise, with many places blooming for the very first time, all due to human activities, costing Australians $200 million every year. The world's largest blue-green algal bloom occurred in 1991 in Australia's own Murray-Darling River. The bloom stretched over 1,000 kilometres in Australia's most significant agricultural lands, encompassing half of our cropland, sheep and orchards, 53% of our cereal crop and 95% of our oranges. During a bloom, river water can't be used for irrigation, livestock watering, drinking, recreation or anything else. But by the time the 1991 bloom was detected, it was already too late for the 1,600 sheep that died from drinking river water laced with neurotoxins produced by the blue-green algae. As soon as the bloom was detected, authorities issued a red alert, which means river water can't be used. Murray-Darling River is shared between New South Wales, Victoria, and Austra South Australia. So not being able to use river water is a huge deal that affects many people and industries. Water has to be trucked in from elsewhere. Authorities found that pollution and excess agricultural irrigation caused the bloom, which is not surprising since over 200 towns dispose of sewage in the Murray-Darling, and excess irrigation causes fertilizer runoff of around 500 tons of phosphorus and 2,780 tons of nitrogen in the Murray-Darling every year. The bloom prompted authorities to create the Blue-Green Algal Task Force, which devised a five-year strategy in an attempt to prevent future blooms. Their plan included nutrient control programs such as planting ground covers to add stability to the soil and slow water flow, which also lets the soil absorb water and nutrients instead of washing away, and also agricultural best management practices to decrease the amount of nutrients applied in the first place. They also implemented weekly sampling of river water at multiple sites to detect cyanobacteria biomass volume, nutrient concentrations, pH, and water temperature. In 2009 and 2010, the Murray-Darling bloomed again, but early detection through weekly sampling prevented loss of human and animal life. To try and prevent future blooms, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority developed a plan to re-establish ecological well-being and return water to the Murray-Darling Basin. Farmers protested because they believed the plan would cripple their farms and wallets. The plan was altered in 2011, revised in 2012, and finally became law the same year. Water use is now coordinated to maintain water levels in the Murray-Darling, which will help water flow and prevent the Heme Dam from falling below 6%, the magic number that contributes to favorable bloom conditions. Irrigation has to be more efficient, which will reduce runoff and eutrophication. As you saw, anthropogenic eutrophication and subsequent algal blooms are a complicated issue encompassing many different industries, most of which rely on river water, yet also contribute to eutrophication. There have been smaller blooms in the Murray-Darling since 2012, so eutrophication is still occurring despite the new policy. If we want to stop anthropogenic eutrophication of the Murray-Darling and the rest of the world, 
Industry, policy, producers, and consumers all need to work together because without water, we have nothing. Thanks for watching.